Apologetics. Okay. A lot of what we're going to do um, in this hour is go over a lot of the material you've already seen from Dr. Geisler. And at the end, I'll give you some more personal ties that are relevant, I think, at least in my life. And that'll help maybe get you guys introduced to me even a little better, know what some of uh, the relationships are, and to tie back uh, the importance, the critical nature of apologetics. So we are in the wrong deal here. So let me get out of this. And turn on to something else. Right there. All right. Apologetics 101. Let's let you guys talk a little bit because has everybody watched the Geisler videos? Yes, sir. Yeah. You've seen them? I've never heard of them before. He's really cool. You, you, Don, have you seen them? I started watching it and um, I got it downloaded and everything. So. Okay. I, I, I haven't watched a lot too yet, but I've watched the first six okay. of Dr. Norman Geisler was probably, in our time, uh, the greatest academic apologist of our time. There are popular apologists and there are academic apologists. Popular apologists would be guys like Josh McDowell. Uh, Josh is, uh, I've met Josh a dozen times, had dinner with him a couple of times. Uh, he is, he wrote the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, his background is that he was a non-believer. And Josh set out to prove that Christianity was just a bunch of malarkey. Hmm. And so he went at apologetics from the backside. He went into it investigating and looking for reasons not to believe. And in, his, in that research that he did, he was doing things like, well, what evidence is there for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I mean, really. How can we have evidence of the resurrection of Christ? And, it, and even if we have evidence, is it good evidence? Meaning, is it, are the sources close to the time that it was written, that the events actually happened? Are, are those sources close to that time? So if you've got a source, for instance, that's a thousand years after an event, there's probably less likelihood that you're going to have total confidence in that source, right? But what, what if it happened five years after the event, 20 years after the event? Then that source is closer to the event. What if they were an eyewitness to the event? Okay, what if, what if they were an eyewitness and their life was put in jeopardy if they reported the truth concerning the, the facts of the resurrection? Were they a better witness then? Were they, were they more credible then? Do you see what I'm saying? That, that's better evidence for the historicity of, of the text. And so Josh set out to prove this was, this was not something to be held uh, with any degree of truth, that it's all just a fiction, and he ended up more that he learned, the more he began to understand, and he's ended up written a book, writing a book about this thick now, originally it was about half that thick, and then he wrote volume two, called Evidence that Demands a Verdict, Volume 2, and now it's just called the whole thing together is the new evidence that demands a verdict. It's the whole volume. Mm -hmm. So you can buy the whole volume together. And he gives historical context. He gives historical references. He gives all the information concerning those historical references. He, he looks at things like, okay, well, what about the creation? Is there any evidence for the creation? So he goes into the area of science. And he looks at what, what can we learn from science that points us back to the creation. Well, pre the Hubble telescope, you had these conflicting views, the scientific view, if you will, and the biblical view. Biblical view says God created the earth in six days and he rested on the Sabbath. The scientific view said the original scientific view said the earth is eternal. 
And so if the earth was eternal, there was no creation. Well, then we've got evidence that came in through various sources, but the Hubble telescope, that the Hubble telescope, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they sent it into space. They sent it out there and they looked way out into space. Well, what are, you, what are you seeing when you're looking way out into space? The past. You're looking at the past. Light that is traveling in light years, but may have, have begun that source of travel to you a, a million years ago. So you're looking into the past. Well, in the Hubble telescope, they saw something called the red shift. And the red shift was the, the reverberations, if you will, the evidence of the creation, the Big Bang, that, that they, as they called it. So the Big Bang took place. Well, then a lot of scientists just didn't like the fact that this, that this evidence was there for the Big Bang. Why? Yes. Because it matched up with Genesis. And as, as, uh, as Frank Turek says, it was evidence for the bang, and they just don't know the banger. <laughs> so there, there had to be a cause, in other words, for the bang to have taken place. So all of these are evidences. All of these are apologetic tools. So if you're talking to a guy, like I was talking to a guy over in Garberville one day, who was a homeless guy, but his background was science, and he was a brilliant scientist. And so we got to talking about the red shift. And there's an opposite view of that that's the other side of the red shift. The red shift goes this way, if you will. The blue shift goes this way. And so we got to talking about these events in time. And, and the argument came out concerning the creation. He says, well, you know, th that's probably the best evidence for a cause. There had to be a cause because what, what was before the creation? God. Okay. Nothing what was before was, the creation? Nothing that was not made. Okay, you said nothing. What does that mean? Does that mean like this room is empty? The room is empty and so there's nothing in the room? Is that what it means? I mean, you just done a word study here, but I'm yeah. trying to get you into thinking about these things a little bit. Right? Yeah. Nothing that was not made, yes. So it's just empty, I guess. But empty is a word, so we empty, could be, empty, yeah. empty yeah. infers that there's something there yeah. that could it's, hold yeah. something, yeah. right? It it's literally means, yeah. listen to this, it literally means no thing. No thing, yeah. So ex nihilo creation, out of nothing, no thing, came everything. No time, no matter, no space. Albert Schweitzer called it infinite density. I'm not sure exactly what that means, and but it sounds that? cool, right? What's that? <laughs> infinite density is the idea that there is no thing. Infinite. No uh, space. Nothing is one. No time, no matter. So th these are just tools that you say, okay, I can, I can look into this and I can see uh, a relevance for a guy that's a scientist, now we can have a conversation about apologetic issues that he understands and can relate to. Okay. Okay. This guy was knew much more about these things than I did, but I knew enough to talk to him about it. So now I'm a credible witness. All right. So what is apologetics? 1 Peter 3.15, what does it say? It says... Set apart the Lord God in your hearts and be ready to always give a reason in Greek is apologia for the hope that is in you with uh, yeah for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or gentleness and respect. But That's in your bad. heart, let's let's just look at the text here a minute because there's a there's there's a lot of meat here we won't get into but let's just look. Let's, let's look at at least some surface issues here. But in your hearts, the, the core of your being, honor Christ as Lord. Okay, how do I do that? Well, he's going to tell you. Honor him as Lord, as holy, and here's how. Always being prepared to make a defense or to give an answer. Defense or answer is that word ap apologia, right? Apologia. To make a defense, give an answer for 
and, and to give it a reason for to anyone, anyone that what? Who will ask you. Anyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. And then do this with gentleness and respect. So in other words, we were talking about before uh, the class started tonight, uh, some of us that part of the part of the reputation of Christian apologists is we, we carry around the baggage of some apologists that have not contended for the faith well. In other words, they did not do it with gentleness and respect. And so we carry around the stigma of all apologists are arrogant people who think they know it all. So what do I do when I first come in contact with somebody? What do I do with this guy on the square there in Garberville? I sat down and started talking to him. We didn't talk about the Bible. We didn't talk about a lot of stuff. Where are you from? What's your background? Why are you here? Uh, you know, I'm a pastor at the local church down here. Have you ever been to church? Well, boy, it just opened up all kinds of things. And immediately he starts shooting this science stuff at me. And this is why I don't believe. And I went, okay, okay, okay. That's, that's good. I, we, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation. But now I know where to start, don't I? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to start with biology, right? Because he's not a biologist. But he is interested in space. He is interested in those kinds of scientific issues. So now we can talk about that. I know where to start. So apologetics is giving a reason or a defense, but you've got to know where to start to give that reason or defense, don't you? So what happens is we began a conversation. I didn't wait for him to go, now will you tell me about the creation of it? I saw he was interested, and I asked him questions concerning that, and I got enough information to know he wasn't a believer. But in that information, I knew where to start having a conversation with him. And within that, his responses to me gave me reason to think and to understand that he was needing answers. So for, for the apologist, we have to be part biologist. We have to have some, some ability with the languages. We've got to have some ability to sit down and have a conversation about historical evidence. Well, what is historical evidence? Is it like scientific evidence that you can do the same experiment in the laboratory and come up with the same stuff over and over again and that's how you know that, that it works? Is history like that? No, history is not like that. So we've got to know what is, what is the difference between historical evidence and what makes it credible, things that I've already mentioned, uh, manuscripts close to, close to the event, multiple sources of the same event. So 500 people see Jesus after the resurrection. Have, have multiple sources seen him? Did many people report on that? Were there many people, historians, who were not Christians that reported on the empty grave? Well, sure, there were. So for me to understand that, to be a good apologist, I've got to have all of those tools and those resources to be able to draw from. So I've got a lot of different, I've got philosophy, I've got theology, I've got biology, I've got archaeology. All of those things are resources we can draw from to have a conversation with somebody about the legitimacy of the Christian faith. Okay? So we've got to be a little bit expert in all of those areas. And then what happens is inevitably you're going to run into somebody like this guy. He agreed to meet with a week later and have another conversation. Well, what do you think I did during that week? Study up on Man, I studied like the dickens to try to find out yeah. everything I could about the things I knew he was interested in. Then when I went back to him, I said, you know, I was reading this book. In fact, I want to loan you a copy of it. Evidence that demands a verdict. It's talking about some of those same things we talked about. And I'll, I'm going to just loan this to you. Could you meet with me a week from now and we'll just sit down and talk about this again? Now, he's going to be informed like I became informed, and we can have a, a legitimate, good conversation that is rooted in truth. And he's going to begin to read some, some things from a guy who was not a believer, who, who also became a believer. So you see how this process goes. Yeah. Okay, so... Let me just give you a little commercial here. Thursday night, next week, 
October the 1st, 7 p.m., KMUD Radio, a program called Thinking Clearly. You're going to get to hear some apologetics in action. Cool. Okay. So, what is that station, do you know? KMUD, KMUD. Okay. There's, a, there's a station, I think there's one in, in Eureka as well as, you know, all up and down the, the West Coast. Okay. And the, the, the subject matter is the character and nature of truth. Now, one of the primary things we do as apologists is to search out and defend the truth. You've already heard a lot about that already tonight from Pastor John, right? Mm -hmm. That if, we, if, we, if we're not talking about the truth, then all of this is just story. It's just some kind of a, a fictitious narrative. But if we can show that it's the truth, and so what happens in our culture? If people are not attacking Jesus up front, they're going to attack the credibility of truth outright. What Pastor John mentioned, postmodernism. We came into an age in the 1960s and 70s that went through people like uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, these French guys, boy, they blistered us on this, this whole postmodernist thing. Derrida is, was a literary deconstructionist. What did he do? John will appreciate this. He went in and deconstructed language. He said a word does not have meaning. What did Pastor John tell you, and I've told you many times before? Words actually do have meaning. Hmm. Right? So Derrida says the word doesn't have meaning. You've got to investigate that word, and you've got to deconstruct it and come to some understanding. Even though you thought you understood what that word meant, now we're beginning to read a sentence. We've got to take that word that you thought you knew what it meant and deconstruct it and put it back together again, and before we ever look at the second word, we come to a preliminary understanding of what word one means, now we look at the second word and we deconstruct that, and then we gotta go back to the first word in light of what we learned in the second word and try to come up with some meaning for the sentence. Now you wanna go insane and try that for a while. <laughs> so Derrida did in language what Jacques Foucault did to philosophy. Foucault said there is no truth. There absolutely is no truth. Truths, things become true, but there is no foundational truth. Is that true? Do what? Is that true? No, that's exactly the good question. So if there is no absolute truth, relative. Is that, is that an absolute true statement, or are you saying rel that it's a relative truth that there is no absolute truth? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is yes, a self-defeating statement is what that is. Okay? But you have all of the, this history around the 60s and 70s of taking apart. And then you get to a guy, uh, Thomas Kuhn, who said that even within science, now we're really jumping into not just philosophy and not just trying to deconstruct language, but within science there is no truth. We only have paradigms. And if there is no fact in science, what's the purpose of science? So this whole deconstruction of truth, so the, the deconstructionist in the postmodern period were relativist, uh, they, they were pluralist. Relativist meaning that no there, there is no absolute truth, it's all relative truth. Yeah. Uh, pluralist would say there, there is truth, but Kenneth can have a truth for him that is, that is true for him, and I can have a truth for me that's totally opposite of that, but it's true for me. And that's okay. And they can be totally opposite one another and, and be in conflict with one another, but it's true for him, so that's cool. And thus we come up with, the, with these statements that we're hearing today. Well, would, would you share with me your truth? Or let me tell you about my truth, right? It's relativism. It's, it's pluralism. It's, it's postmodernism. But uh, the, the way this format's going to go on the radio is there'll be three of us. There's two philosophers. The philosophers will be asking me questions. I will be asking them questions. And then we ask one another questions till we come to an understanding of at least what the other person is saying. Cool. 
So it'll be an hour-long program of just this. Uh, and, and it'll be approached from my standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint. Why would that be? Why would I not argue the Bible with these people? They don't have the uh, Bible's a, a, a um, absolute. Is an absolute, and all you do is uh, you're you come out. They, they don't believe the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Right. You want to start with something. You want to start with something they believe in yeah. to read something. Exactly. You, don't, you don't start with something they don't know. You start with something they do know to get to where they don't know. Exactly right. So when when you hear me, I'm not going to be going well. First Peter three fifteen says. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the okay. going to fall asleep. Yeah. If if I'm if I'm going to argue with them, I need to argue with them and argue with a pos is a positive concept in, in theological debate. If I'm going to argue my point with them, I've got to argue a philosophical point. Okay, I may in the course of this come back to, and this is why Christians believe what they did and why Luke one says this. You understand what I'm, what the difference, though? I'm not starting with Luke 1. I'm arguing from a philosophical position back to the truth statement made biblically. Meeting them on the ground. And so when, if I can get them to agree with me, back to that point, I'm going to make the biblical reference. Now they've got a, a hook to hang on that, that they've agreed back with me to that point, and, the, and I can point to something that says, well, the Bible says that right here. So I don't know how that conversation will go. It's going to be live. So I have no concept of how it's going to go. I can't say, well, this is what happened because it hadn't happened yet. <laughs> but it'll also be recorded on their website, so you'll be able to go to their website, pick it up, or move it into your phone or whatever. So, yeah. But that's apologetics in action. It, it is a great opportunity to get apologetics out there to a lot of people and do it on a in a format that... that People that are tuning into this particular program is called Thinking Clarity. It's all about critical thinking. They tune into this program, even people that don't listen to anything else on KBIRD, because they like this kind of philosophical conversation. But they've never heard anything like what we're going to do on KMUD Thursday night, because usually they're just interviewing somebody that's authored a book. And so they'll ask him questions and he'll give them answers to that. But this is going to be a discussion. And it's being promoted as a civil discussion that shows that even though we've got very different views and very different beliefs, we can still sit in and have civil conversation. And, and part of my objective here, part of my ulterior motive, if you will, is to show that apologists really can be civil. Amen. So Good. That's, that's the whole yeah. background of this little deal. So let's get in and we're going to relook at some of these things that Dr. Geisler went over. Let me, let me give you a little background on Dr. Geisler. Uh, Dr. Geisler wrote over 100 books in his lifetime. Over 100 books of apologetics in his mm. lifetime. Wow. Uh, that's a pretty incredible feat. Yeah. He was also the primary Christian uh, person for the defense of the Christian faith in Scopes Monkey Trials 2. Hmm. There were two Scopes Monkey Trials. The first one was older than Geisler. The second one, he was the primary Christian source and, and, and person that they put up as a witness for the Christian faith. So, and what were these all about? What were Scopes about? Monkey Trials, I guess it's evolution. Is on the evolution, yeah. Uh, yeah. being able to teach creation in the schools, okay. Okay. evolution debate. So all of those things were in that. Well, he was the guy internationally that was put up for that. That's how he got his first notoriety. But he, he just died about a year and a half ago, I guess now, a year and a half before time flies. But uh, went back for the funeral. Uh, Robbie Zacharias did the eulogy at his funeral because Robbie was a student of Geisler's. Yeah. So when Geisler taught at Dallas Theological Seminary, Robbie sat in a, 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 his class and said, yeah, Robbie. So if you listen to Robbie, you've listened to Geisler. I mean, he, everything he got, he got from Geisler. Okay, so to make a defense, uh, to give a reason, that's what you're doing. You're not being defensive, and apologetics is also not apologizing. Yeah. It is giving a defense without being defensive. It is giving an answer without being arrogant. 
And that's, that's what we must do as apologists. So here's, here's a few things that Geisler touched on. So let's look at them again and see if you've got any questions. This is to build a positive case. We want to be defending the objective nature of truth. That's what the radio show is all about. These two philosophers, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect having listened to them and listened to several of their shows on, on the radio, will be arguing for a relative truth or a pluralistic truth. So I suspect that's what will happen. And in, in case you don't understand how critical this is, let, let me give you one example. Uh, I don't know that I'll use this example because it's, it's kind of an in-your-face example, but if I determine I need to, I, I, I could draw on this. Back in 19, late 1930s into, into the 40s and World War II coming on, there was a lot of this thought beginning to develop. Of course, everybody knows that Hitler almost conquered the entire world. Now, if you look at it strategically and tactically, militarily, there's no way he could have gone as far as he did with what he had. But he had another weapon that was not a militaristic weapon. It was a philosophical uh, weapon. A guy by the name of Joseph Goebbels, as you may have heard of, uh, convinced Hitler that if he just said something loud enough, this, these are Goebbels words, loud enough, often enough, and convincingly enough, that it would be true in every person's mind over a period of time. So what did he do? He convinced, almost convinced the world that he really wasn't doing this stuff to the Jews. That was just propaganda to, to come out against him. He really wasn't doing at this, the stuff you're seeing on your TV screens, that wasn't really happening. You know, that, that, there's another explanation for that. And then the, the other giant uh, untruth that he told, right from the outset, was that they were the superior race, they had superior weaponry, superior supplies, superior intelligence, and, and no, the world could not win. They, they were unbeatable. They had everything they needed to totally conquer the world, and they actually convinced people of that to the point that when they went into some major cities, there was no resistance whatsoever. They just walked in and took over. He said it often enough, loud enough, and it became the truth in people's minds. It wasn't the truth, was it? It was propaganda. But Goebbels, it took, him, it took Goebbels almost two years to convince Hitler that that would, that that would work. And that was a strategic weapon in his, in his quiver of arrows and that he needed to use. Uh, 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 being as they said that it was easy for Hitler to do that because the one thing the Jews didn't do was fight back. Yeah. They just, because they believed that, what he said, so there was no resistance. Yeah. Because they, he's got... You know, he convinced them, no matter what you do, I got you. So they showed no resistance. And you could think of, was it because of the Christianity? Not to fight? Or did, was it well, was the fact that they knew that he, was, that he convinced them that he was unbeatable? There, you had a combination of things happening there, but the fact is Hitler would never have gone as far as he did had that not happened the way that it did. And he, he employed this weapon. Now what, what is important there is what he was saying was not true. So truth becomes, you begin to see the whole world was at stake here over what was really true. Well, the whole world's salvation is at stake here over whether this is true. So we've, we've got even a greater uh, responsibility as Christ followers to be able to share the gospel in a way that, that brings life to the meaning to a particular individual. So defending the nature of truth and the objectivity of truth, it's not, truth is not subjective, it's objective. It's not relatively true. Relative truth would be a contradiction in terms. 
Absolute oh. truth is a redundancy. Military intelligence. Are you with me? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so the, fir the very first thing we need to be able to defend is truth. Now, here's, here's something that I used in the prison ministry about a year and a half ago, back when we still could go into the prisons before COVID. I had a Muslim come to our, our chapel service. And the Muslim at, began to give me a defense of, of Islam. He was a pretty good Islamic apologist. He began to give me a defense of Islam. And I asked him when he got through, I just listened. And when he got through, I asked him, I said, so if I could show you that where the majority of what you said clearly, definitively was not true, and I could show you the answers on the Christian side of that that would answer those things that you're asking. And I could convince you of that. Would you move from, from Islam to Christianity? And here's what he said, no. Without thinking, without, even, without, without batting an eye, no. Well, here's the difference. If he could convince me it was true, I would change. Why? Because truth is primary. Right? One of the great mistakes we've made as Christians, historically, is when all the stuff began to come out with Dar the Darwinian theory, and scientists said, it's not just theory, it's true. That Christians ran into their corner, and pastors, for the most part, took their little congregations and ran over in the corner and said, you stay over here. Science is over there, they have their talk and their answers, and Christianity and faith is over here. We have our talk and our answers. And what's true for them is not true for us. And what we should have been doing is embracing what was known and pointing out that it was theory and it was not rooted in genuine science, which means it was not rooted in truth. Amen. That's where the gap came. Said, yeah, those are years of uh, saying it loud enough. And loud yeah. Enough, yeah. So now what's happened? We're still teaching Darwinism, and yet we've got some of the greatest scientific minds in the world, mathematicians who are statisticians, biologists, who understand how these things have to develop, and they sit down together and they put their heads together, and these greatest minds in the world, guys, uh, like Stephen Meyer, uh, who is one of the greatest biologists in the world, sat down with a guy by the name of David Glittner, who is a Yale mathematics professor and statistician. And they figured out that there just wasn't enough time and not enough, there were, there, within the Cambrian layer, there were no transitional forms, and yet millions of life forms just appeared on the spot. With no transitional forms. Hmm. What does Darwinism depend on? Transitional forms. So how do we explain that? Well, they couldn't. So you, you have most scientists today just going, well, instead of evidence, what we want you to look at is this whole thing over here known as the scientific narrative or the paradigm of Darwinism. It's not science. It's not science, but, but that's where science, a lot of scientists are. The true scientists today, though, are coming back and, 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 say, and challenging that and just saying, we don't like, like the Littner is not a believer. He's, a, he's an agnostic at best. And Glittner says, look, this was distressing to me. To me, Darwinism was an elegant answer to the problem that we have before us as scientists. I want to believe Darwinism. But I can't because it just did not happen. He's a statistician. He says, scientifically, status, for, as a statistician, I can tell you, it's not just impossible, it's way beyond impossible. So he's saying, I wanted it to be true. Well, you've got guys like Stephen Meyer, who, who is promoting this whole understanding and idea of intelligent design. He never uses the word God. He just says, there is obviously a designer here. But, but Glittner is respecting Meyer, who just wrote a book, by the way, called Darwin's Doubt. You need to get a hold of that. Darwin's Doubt. 
uh, Stephen Meyer. And, and Glittner says, this is one of the greatest scientific reads out there. Even though I don't agree with Stephen Meyer's conclusion that, that there is an intelligent designer called God, I have to say that he has thought through these processes and he is approaching this more as a scientist than many of our scientists are. Really. Giving a reason. Providing a defense for miracles is another area. Uh, arguing for the credibility of the gospel record, the evidence for the historical record. Uh, how close are the events to the times that things were written? Are there multiple sources? Are there many eyewitnesses? Do we have records of those eyewitnesses? And so on and so forth. And then reasoning for divine authority of the Bible. Uh, all of those are areas of apologetics. So let's look at a couple of things here. We could look at the positive case for the gospel. And then negatively, we want to look at answering objections to faith. Negatively meaning people are asking questions, maybe they're not just negative, but they're asking questions that are challenging the biblical record. Okay? Is that am I making myself yeah, clear? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we want, we want to be able to handle those kinds of things. And then evangelistically, we want to pave the way for somebody to believe. What is my hope coming out of, I, I would like to see both these philosophers Thursday night begin to think in lines that will eventually lead them to a relationship to Christ. So if I could just give them one, one link that they can hang on to and go, I never knew there was an answer for that, but here's a, here's a probable answer. I need to th at least think through that. Because these guys are thinkers. They're, they're, they're philosophers. So that's pre-evangelism. I'm not evangelizing them. I'm laying the groundwork for the Holy Spirit to come in and begin to do His work, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm meeting them on their territory, on their ground, doing some pre-evangelism. So that's, that's part of giving answers to essential pre-evangelistic questions is basically what we're trying to accomplish. Here's... Here's an interesting set of statistics that we talked about a little bit ago before the class. We want to be able to answer the heathen according to Acts 14. We normally can do that through talking about nature, creation, those kinds of things. We want to be able to give an answer to the Jews. So if you're talking to a Jewish person, go back to the Old Testament. Let's start on some common ground, right? Let's, let's go back and do that and then maybe eventually, maybe not in the first conversation, but in the 10th or 12th conversation with that person, maybe we get to Isaiah 53. Something that the Jews skip over and never want to talk about. The answers for that. But, I, but I've got to build some trust with this person first. I've got to build some credibility with them first. So I want to be able to have those kind of conversations with our Jewish friends. And then with the Greeks, we get an example of Paul at Mars Hill, right? Come let us reason together from Isaiah. What's he going to do? He's going into the realm of the philosophers. And he's beginning to have conversations with them that will eventually lead back to conversations and linkages, defenses for the Christian faith. So we're not coming in and just blasting people. Well, let me tell you about science. Let me tell you about the biology. Let me tell you about the historical record. Let me tell you about the evidences for the resurrection. A friend of mine wrote a book about two years ago on the resurrection. 700 pages on the evidences for the resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want a good technical read, it's excellent. <laughs> and then uh, Acts chapter 20, for Christians, we can use Jesus' words, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, for the heathen, we, use, we, we start where heathens are. For Jews, we start where Jews are. For Christians, we start where Christians are. And for philosophers, we start where philosophers are. Yeah, start at their level. We start at yeah. where, they, where yeah. they are thinking already. So. Okay. So what, what is apologetics? It's giving a defense. Why do we do apologetics? Because the Bible commands it. 1 Peter 3.15 is a command of God. Always be prepared. How often? Always. Always. 
So we're commanded as, as Christians, not as apologists, but as Christians, to always be ready. Always be ready to give an answer. What's the failure in our culture today? We pat little Johnny on the head that, that asks us a question, and we go, just have faith. And we send him on his way, and little Johnny goes away and says, well, I got faith in Santa Claus and in Tooth Fairy and, you know, a host of other Easter Bunnies. And I'm going to put Jesus right along with those, I guess, because I'm supposed to just have faith. We don't give legitimate answers to their questions. So we've got to be ready to give that answer. And Philippians 1.7, the ESV says it this way, uh, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Same word apologetic. Apologetics, get the, get the word apologetics from. I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. In Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may, here's the purpose statement, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You go where they are, you start where they are. So what does that mean? It means we need to be apologists and have at least a, a little bit of of the skills of apologetics in each of those areas that we can go back to. And then be willing to have the resources, the evidence that demands a verdict kind of materials that show here is why you know you can know this is true. Here is the evidence for what I'm telling you. So let me ask you, why don't Christians do apologetics? Mm. Denial. Time. Denial. Denial. I tell you, that's, that's a good question. I'm two years into this. I don't, I don't understand. I, um, what I've heard from the at the mission is uh, you don't need it. You know, the the spirit spirit moves you. If I feel uh, the spirit move me, why should I? You know, and uh, most of the time it's just that. Uh, um, you believe because I believe and you should believe. That's it. There you go. Yeah. I believe it, you should believe it. Yeah. Mama believed it. Yeah. You, you questioned my mama? Yeah. Hmm. Well, how come most people who question the Bible don't know that Harvard is time? Is, is like, to, to, be, to be able to do apologetic, you simply have to know what you're talking about. And most people aren't oh. really willing to put in the time to actually know what they're talking about. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's call a spade a spade. We're lazy. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Let's find out why. Yeah. We, we need to study this stuff. Yeah. And the biggest reason is we're too lazy to do it. Yeah. Well, they well just well, I, if I go to church on Sunday morning, we're, that's, I'm good. Yeah. I walked the aisle when I was seven. I'm good. But what is the Bible true? Well, I guess it's mostly true. Well, if it's true... And it commands us to do this. Explain to me. I don't get it. Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager. This is Paul writing. Uh, and this shows a lot of love as well. The love. He starts off saying, I, I love you essentially. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. Well, Paul evidently knew there was, there was some answers that need to be given, and the, they were not contending for the faith. So I've got to write to you concerning this. You need to be contending for the faith. You need to be giving answers. You need to be a better apologist. That was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. The corruption of the church happens because apologists don't stand up and, and bring a defense against the false teaching that comes into the church. As John said earlier, that's where we get Mormons, that's where we get Jehovah's Witnesses. That's where we get the damn door locks that live seven doors down from us in, in Colorado, who said he was the Christ. Yeah. He has followers all over the world. That's where we get the guys down in, in South America, to Jesus, to Jesus. Who says he's the Christ? 
But we've got to be able to get answers to these people. We, we had three different families come out of Dan Dorlock's cult while we were in Colorado just over conversations that we had with them. One of them, primarily because Elva was working as a teacher alongside of, of one of the guy's wives that was in this cult. And she began talking to the teacher, and I began talking to her husband, and he, he called me an idiot. He says, oh, look, I've been where you've been. I was a son of Baptist. I was. I was a deacon of my church. That's what he told me. And he says, you're crazy. He says, I can show you the Christ. He's right here. And then one night, out of the blue, about 10 o'clock, one night my phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was this guy. And he says, I'm leaving the call. He had been following Dan Rorlock 28 years. Wow. 28 wow. years. He had raised his kids with Dan Rorlock being their Messiah. He says, I'm leaving. Why? You spurred some thoughts. I got to thinking about this thing. Things didn't quite make sense like I thought they did. Salvations depend on it. So certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were des designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Why do it? Luke 1 4. It seems good to me to write to you an orderly account to you that you may have certainty. The church needs certainty. Is that true, John, of the church today? We need, our people need to understand the truth of the gospel. They need to have certainty in their faith. faith a Christian's faith is not a blind leap into the darkness. It's a confident step into the light. That's the way Paul really presents faith all the way through Scripture. Over and over again, we see Paul talking about a growing faith, a building faith. Certainty concerning the things you have been taught is I want you to have that confidence. The Bible commands it. The culture demands it. We need in our culture, if we've ever needed it, an, an objective defense for truth. Now, let me, I'm not trying to get political here, so don't, please don't accuse me of politics here, but let me just give you an example that's very relevant for us today. All of you have heard of Black Lives Matter, right? Yeah. Okay, there, there is a whole uh, theory within that, if you go to their website, that is critical race theory. You heard of that? No. Critical race theory. Let me tell you what the premises and foundations of critical race theory are. And it's on their webpage, you can see it. Facts are whiteness and therefore racist. Objective knowledge is whiteness and therefore racist. Whiteness like color? Like color. Like yeah, that's just another word for, for being, okay. using racial things. Okay, okay. Uh, the scientific method is whiteness. How can I have a conversation with somebody about factual things when it's considered racist to do that? Do, do you understand the problem and why we've got to make a defense for truth? Yeah. If I can't use facts, I can't use truth, we can't have an objective conversation about things we know objectively and we have, we have understanding of, and that's considered racist to begin with, we have no place to go. We must defend truth. Listen, I've been going to South Africa for over 30 years, partly, partly to understand what happened during apartheid. I want to understand what took place there because I have many excellent young pastors in Southern Africa that I want, I want to understand what happened to them and why they are coming through the mindset they are towards every other place in the world. So I don't consider myself a racist person. But I don't, know, I don't know how to have a conversation with them unless we talk about the truth of the gospel and the truth and nature of, of truth to begin with. If I can't use facts, what can we use? 
And we're just dividing people and dividing people and dividing people. Go to the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg, you know what you'll find? There's over 900 official government races designated in South Africa alone. Because they got to blacks and then they realized that they had to divide that group into different groups. And then you had colors in blacks. And then you had different types of colors and different kinds of blacks from different tribal groups. And then you had the Indian population. And then you had these mixed race groups. Well, then you had over 900 official. And so what happened? They divided and divided and divided and we can't talk to each other anymore. We have no common truth. And one of the things I, I preach there every time I go, every time I go, is we may be different in, in all the ways that are obvious, but the one thing we have in common is more important than everything else, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. We've, we've got to start with a truth, and if Jesus is not who he says he is, we can't even start with him. So do you, understand, you begin to understand the defense of truth, how important it is. Relativism is there is no view, no view at all that there is absolute truth whatsoever. Pluralism, all views are relatively true. Uh, you're, you have a truth and I have a truth and they're all equally valid, even though they're opposite to one another. Naturalism, there is no supernatural view. That's where Richard Dawkins is. And, and guys that are, that are so-called new atheists. They just believe there is no supernatural world, so they rule that all together. And if you want to talk about something, some evidence for the supernatural, it will write you off as superstitious and, and a little bit crazy. So we're not going to talk about that. So apologetics answers these objections to the faith. And so we've got to be ready to do that. And I have a bunch of tangents here. But let's, get, let's try to get out of the problem. Christianity is declaring an absolute truth in a relativistic world. Do you see the problem there? Yeah, yeah. We are declaring an exclusive message or making an exclusive Absolutely. truth claim in a pluralistic mindset. Well, are you telling me Christianity is the only way to heaven? Well, let's see. Did Jesus make an exclusive truth claim in John 14, 6? Yeah, the truth of it. I am, and no one comes to the Father but by me. <coughs> and we were preaching a supernatural view and a naturalistic view. No way. So we've got a challenge. We've, and we've got to be ready to, to meet that challenge. So, uh, thirdly, the church needs it. Talk to the people in Red Way and ask them where they were in their spiritual growth and their spiritual walk with the Lord six years ago and where they are today. And to what do they attribute the difference? It's apologetic teaching. Mm -hmm. Ask them. Y'all ask them. Okay. Ask them. Linda's a great witness for what apologetics has done in that, in that church. Okay, so why do apologetics? Because our teens need it as well. 80% of teens active in the church. They're active in the church, leave in their the church in their twice. The main reason they stay, stay is that they have doubts, and they have doubts because they ask questions and never got answers. They were patted on the head. They were told everything was cool, we'll just hang, hang in there half hour. And my question is always, have faith in what? Yeah. Have faith in faith? Have faith in me? So. Have faith in your mother? Is she going to save your eternal soul? You know, have faith in what? So, when do doubts begin? These are the statistics that Geisler gives. 4% begin to doubt in grade school. So their doubts begin very early. Why do we need to start teaching these very primitive apologetic principles to, our, to children? Because they're already 4% have doubt in, in grade school. 40% by middle school are having doubts. That's huge. Then they continue to go to church. You know why they go to church? The parents tell them to go. They, they, maybe they have some friends that are in the youth group. They're cool. Or this really cool girl. Man, she's, man, she's, she's at church. I'm going to go there. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, those, those kids are on ski trips. 
That's why I've been going to church. But they don't believe. They have, they're beginning to have doubts. Why are they having doubts? Because there's not good teaching. 44% in high school, and only 11% actually in college begin to doubt at that point. They've already started doubting. They're on their own. They're, they're on their own, but now they, they begin in grade school, they depart the faith when they're in college. Only 9% of evangelicals, now this, this, is not, this is not the broad Christian community, but evangelical Christians, only 9% of evangelical Christians have a Christian worldview. But uh, that one didn't really get that one. What do you mean by that? They don't have a proper understanding of the gospel. They don't have a proper understanding of the world as it really is. In, in, in the, they're they, they're they, in the bubble and they're just... They would also the question the legitimacy of truth. Okay. There's a, a really good statistical research that just came out. Um, League of Near Ministry yeah. put it out. Uh, R.C. Sproul's, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, oh, what was it? Uh... Because you would ask these questions, ask people in general what they believe about this and that. Uh, you know, did, is is Jesus the only way? You know, or is Jesus really God? Yeah. And kind of gives you a viewpoint of unbelievers, but it asks, but it categorizes, then asks people that who claim Christian or claim evangelical. And and you're, and it says they claim this, but the answers of, to some of these questions are, oh, all these Christians are not saved. Like, like it's not, you know. Do you think you know babies need to be baptized? It's do you believe Jesus is God? Yeah. And it's well, you know, most of the people believe, most of the Christians believe. Like, no, uh, all Christians believe that. There's a lot of people going, and so, but leaving here has a really good um, research article that they put out a couple years, and one just came out the past month yeah. that you can go back and see all these self-proclaimed Christians are not Christian. Yeah, they're they're nominal Christians at best, meaning in name only. I, I go to church, I therefore I consider myself a Christian. El was looking for something to put in some water for me, John. I've got, got some in the okay. bar. Okay. Uh, yeah, just grab the water. Water right here. Okay, so right here. Here, here's the problem. We, we've got a whole uh, Christian community, air quotes, who don't really have a Christian worldview. And we as apologists need to be able to give them an answer for why they should have a Christian worldview. Ask, ask go, to, go to a Southern Baptist church. Let's don't even say just evangelicals. That's a broader category. Let's go to Southern Baptist church. Let's pick on ourselves here a little bit. Stand outside the churches and ask them as they're leaving if they literally believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did he really, was he really raised from the dead? Why is, why is it important that we attack truth? And defend it. Because here's what happened when, when we had this whole split in the in the in our community, and the Christians ran to their corner with sending the scientists off with their darlings. Here's what happened. Christians ran to their corner and they and they they said this. Well, and here's what the Jesus seminar will tell you. Like guys like John Dominic Crossan. Dr. Crossan, Crossan said, it really doesn't matter if these things are true or not. That's not the point. The point is that we just get some moral, good moral teaching out of this. <laughs> oh, wow. So it doesn't matter if it's true that Jesus raised from the dead. It doesn't matter if he was the Son of God. It doesn't matter if he was genuinely dead. Well, who, do, who does the History Channel and these channels show when they do interviews? National Geographic Channel, when they're talking about the, the historical Jesus, they interview Crossan, who says it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Wow. And, and they're the Christian experts they're, they're putting up there as witnesses for the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. Well, it does. Listen, if this isn't true, Paul said it. We're the most pitiful people on earth. Yeah. Yeah. So it does matter. Truth does matter. Evangelicals need apologetics. Even though we're kind of lazy and we don't want to do it. Here's, here's another shocker. Only 51% of evangelical pastors have a Christian worldview. 
man like the problem. If you're, if, uh, as someone who just said, who grew up in, so I grew up in a Mormonism, and I started to ask, I started to ask the, the leaders of my war, let's just say, to be what, what your pastor asked questions, and they didn't know. If your church leaders can't, don't know, then why should you know? Yeah. And so we, we've, got, we've got work to do, don't we? Yeah. We've got work to do. And so we, we need to be prepared, and we need to be prepared not only to defend the faith, but to begin to teach some of these basic apologetic principles and tools so that other people can use them. You, you talk to David O, and David O will tell you that he'd been having conversations with this one guy who's a good friend of his, who's not a believer, he's a, he's a devout atheist. And he said, I didn't have answers for him concerning this whole, and David's big into creation science. But he says, I didn't have answers for him until about two years ago, and now we're having conversations that are legitimately good conversations about truth. So we, we just need to be able to do these things in a way that, that meets people where they are. Because the Bible commands it, because the culture demands it, because the church needs it, and the results confirm it. So let me finish up with this quickly. Paul was waiting for them, it says in Acts 17 of Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. Here is, where is this? What's, what's the event? What's the context here? What's the context of Acts 17? Um, um, that Mars here, Hill? Okay, so he's, he's in the city. He says, I see all these idols. Oh, the, the yeah, no God. And yeah. so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews. Mm -hmm. This is not the, the Stoics or the philosophers. With the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day for those who happen to be there. So he, to the Jew, he started as, with Jewish reason. To the philosophers, he said, come let us reason together and he used philosophy. So when I go into the lion's den on Thursday night, I'm going to be starting philosophically making my arguments. So I want you to understand when you hear this what I'm doing. Okay? I'm not, I'm not avoiding the Bible. I want to work back to it from a place they know how to start. Yeah. Okay? Is everybody with me there? Yeah. You're not going to throw the Bible at them as soon as you walk in. No, because they don't believe yeah, it. Yeah, then it'll shut down. It's, it's, it's yeah. useless because they don't believe it. Yeah. If we're going to start and plant some seeds, we need to start there. So I've already mentioned Josh McDowell. Another guy you may have heard of is Lee Strobel. This is Lee. Uh, a Case for Christ, A Case for the Resurrection, A Case for Easter, all of those books he, he wrote. Uh, he is another person that set out. He was an investigative reporter. And he set out to investigate the Christian faith because his wife had got messed up in this silly church thing. And, and she had accepted Christ. And he was, he was going to prove her wrong. You should, you should go listen to some of his stuff on YouTube. Yeah. He tells a story. Yeah. And I, I love when he talks about getting the, in the elevator with a guy with a cigar. I just think that's hilarious. But he, he's, uh, he, he, he set out to disprove it, and to himself he proved it, and he became a Christian. <laughs> Here is Dinesh D'Souza. If you've seen a decent movie lately, it's probably because Dinesh was involved in it. But Dinesh has spoken at several apologetics conferences, and uh, he is quickly becoming respected in the political world, but he started in the, in the apologetic world. Huh. And he actually wrote a book on the evidences for heaven that I thought was pretty interesting. And then Chuck Colson, uh, some of you might have heard of Chuck, his prison ministry, uh, a, lot of, a lot of mixed reviews on Chuck, a lot of different thoughts about Chuck. Uh, he's an evangelical, his wife was a devout Catholic, so he, he constantly is trying to bring those two groups together, which uh, he and I have had some interesting conversations about, but the work he did with prison ministry was absolutely awesome. And he's, he's still got a, a booming ministry today, many years after his death. And uh, so Chuck is another one that came to Christ by evidence. All these people came to Christ because of the evidence of the gospel and then became apologists themselves. 
Uh, Chuck's ministry now extends into the Colson Center. And uh, he put out a document that was called the Manhattan Declaration. And at this event where this picture was made, uh, he came to me and asked me if I would be willing to be one of the original signers of that declaration. I did. I signed the declaration. It primarily was uh, but for uh, life issues and family issues and those kinds of things. But I got death threats over that. Well, why? Many, many death threats because I signed the original document. There were 150 or so of us originally that were signers of the Declaration. Now I think there's maybe 100,000. I don't know exactly how many, but there's thousands and thousands. Uh, in, in that. But uh, people feel strongly about these issues. And when you start talking about things like life issues, there, people have real hard feelings, and they, they will attack you. Uh, my family was threatened. I was threatened. I was told if I left my house, they had, they had a scope on me. Hmm. I wouldn't live to get to my car, things like that. Uh, but Chuck, and he just soldiered through until the end and had lots of good things. This is Dr. Norman Geisler. Like I said, Geisler wrote over 100 books. Geisler came to faith. Because in his church, he, he became a Christian at a young age because two ladies in a van picked him up and carried him to church. His parents weren't Christians. Just picked him up and carried him to church. But then as he began to ask questions in church, they didn't get any answers. And he said, I became disillusioned. He said, I had to become an apologist. And then he went on to write over 100 apologetic books and to be the primary a defendant or the primary witness for the Christian side of the arguments in Scopes True Monkey Tribes. Uh, probably one of the best books he wrote was with Josh McDowell because you had both an academic and a popular apologist coming together. Uh, Josh did an excellent uh, work of bringing the academic language of Geisler to the people, so to speak. And they wrote a book together on what is Christian love. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's out of print today, but you might can still find old copies on Amazon. And I think it was just called Luck, I'm not sure. But Josh McDowell and Norman Geisler. Okay, and then lastly, last of all, there's people you've never heard of that you will meet in heaven that will have gotten there via having their questions answered by somebody who thought enough of them to study hard enough to give them answers. And, and I could give you dozens of them in our lives that that's the case. We had a couple walk into our church in Arkansas. I'm just going to give one quick story. Walked in our church in Arkansas. They said about halfway back, uh, I knew immediately they were guests. Pastors know these things. I knew immediately after when I went to meet them that they were not Christians or nominal Christians at best. They just moved to town. She was an attorney. He was a retired sheriff from Chico, California. They were not believers. So they heard me preach one Sunday morning. They came back the next Sunday morning. And surprisingly, they came back the third Sunday morning and they walked the aisle and gave their life to the Lord. In fact, I'll tell you the full story. They got there early the third Sunday. I was at the altar praying. And they came up and tapped me on the shoulder and they said, we think we need to be saved. Uh -huh. Why? Because of apologetics. Here's how that apologetics worked. We were invited to dinner the second Sunday they were there and we went to lunch with them. And when I got to her house, I found out that she was a nominal Catholic. And she had all these altars set up in her house, and they loved animals. And so she had these altars set up where she would go around and pray to the different saints for her animals. And so when she gets to St. Francis, she's praying for all the animals, and St. Francis will protect them. And so she looks at me as I'm getting ready to leave. I've already stood up to leave, and she looks at me and she goes, that's all right, isn't it? And I go, well, uh, no, it's not. 
And why? There's a good question. Mm -hmm. Is she asking for an answer? Mm -hmm. To all those that ask, a reason mm -hmm. for the hope that's within you? So we said, now we had a little Bible study, right then and there. The meekness and respect. And so the third Sunday, they came back and got saved. Now, he is a pastor. <laughs> wow. Awesome. He actually helped start a church right there in Arkansas, not too far from where, from where we were. I tried my best to get him not to do that. <laughs> and, uh, I want you in my church, brother. But the Lord had called me. Man. When I went to hear him preach, I was, man, I was so thrilled to hear him preach. Uh, but there are hundreds of those stories, if not thousands of those stories. And some of them are what I call ricochet stories. We, we, we had an effect on one person who was a pastor of the church in somewhere in South Africa, and he preaches to 10,000 people and 1,000 get saved. We, I preached an apologetic message in Newton, North Carolina one Sunday morning, and there was a little child sitting on the front row. He was an orphan. He was living with his grandmother, but his mother had actually left him at a grocery store with his little sister with a, with a pair of underwear and a, and a brown paper bag. And so if somebody found him, eventually took him to his grandmother's. His grandmother lived across the street from us. He, we raised the money to take him with us to Africa. And he preaches to elementary school, and we had over a thousand children come forward and get saved. Huh. Ricochet evangelism. You, you just don't know where this stuff will lead. Now, we're all those saved, we don't know. Or some of them, probably. But here's a young man who studied to learn how to preach for two or three years before we took him to Africa, and then he gets up there as a young teenager and preaches, and children just flock to the altar. In a school, public school. You can do that there. So we, we, we don't know where these things will go. We need to be prepared to give an answer. And so thoughts, questions, comments? All right. Your, your next set of classes will be about a month from now. Let's see my calendar. John, can we come back here? Yeah. Will be okay? Yeah. Um, get my, and next set of videos? Two and three. Two and three. Two and three, three of the guys for the guys. So let's shoot for uh, October 23rd. I think that's what we talked about before, October 23rd. Sounds good. Friday night, October 23rd. What, what was the name of that author for uh, Darwin Stout? Stephen Meyer, Dr. Stephen Meyer. And you should look up on, on YouTube, there's a video with Stephen Meyer, Dr. David Glitner, and Dr. David Berlinski. Berlinski is a philosopher and author. Glittner is a mathematician and statistician, and Meyer is a biologist, and the three of them are being interviewed about the probability that Darwinism can be true. What's the name of the video? Uh, just look up their names. Glittner, Berlinski, David Berlinski, David Glittner, and uh, Stephen Meyer, and maybe just type in Darwin's doubt. That could come up that way too. But it's an excellent interview with those three guys, and it covers some of the things we talked about tonight with regard to science and the importance of, of defending truth in science. If you guys want a, um, a good resource to listen to someone do apologetics and then get to the gospel, um, uh, Todd Friel with Wretched Radio. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's online, there's Spotify, but he's, it's called Witness Wednesday. Um, and every Wednesday he plays recordings um, of his encounters with uh, usually college students and he'll kind of figure out where they're at and so whether it's an engineering major or a science major or a literature major or it's a self-professing Christian or a self-professing atheist or whatever 
but um, it's a good reason. It's helped me uh, think through different ways to approach presenting the gospel um, from from different uh, fields of study or, or uh, thought patterns. So. The biggest thing you have to remember before before you ever get in, if apologetics is pre-evangelism, there's also pre-apologetic work. The pre-apologetic work starts with questions. You want to find out where they are, who they are, where they are, where they're coming from, what, what's their interest. And then you're going to go start there. Find out where they are spiritually and then start where their interests are. So learn how to talk to people. Questions. Um, ask questions. Yeah. Uh, You'd be surprised meet, how easy meet, it is to ask questions. Oh yeah, meet, most people like to talk about themselves, so that's not a hard thing to uh, get, uh, get rolling. Um, uh, but the study, the study, then when you're tired of the study, and study more. That's the, the, the true way of getting it, because if you come at people with uh, that ignorance, you know, not, that's why I find myself is that I, 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 I could walk it out more, I could talk it out, because I, you know, it just, you know, um, coming at them with too much scripture, it's, it's still, it's still coming to me, you know. Not, not more of a statement, and it's not a question. So, being just the study part is going to be the, the immense part of it all. You want, you want to get your your fingers into all of those apologetic pies, and learn enough to start a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. and then you you can begin to defend the faith and go, you know. I probably need to get a book that we can both dig into and have a conversation about. And it gives you a week to study or two weeks to study, whatever you can set up to get back with the person. You don't, you don't have to be a Norm Geisler or a Robbie Zacharias to do apologetics. But you do need to know where to start. So approach somebody, even if you, you know, you can't answer it right then. See, so yeah, there's another one. You, you, what God gives to somebody, you know, that you know, he put in your... Uh, Put in your path to help out. You gotta make sure that you put on the brakes real quick, and you come out of it. No, you know, you know what I'm saying. You, you know, you gotta make sure you're uh, you're equipped for it. Um, if you're not, you know, you're gonna get back to you. I, I've got a, you know, a couple don't, don't guys. Don't be afraid that, to say yeah. you don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's be real. That's the other thing. Yeah, just yeah. be real. Yeah. People, like the guy that I was telling you about it in Garberville. Yeah. Uh, read, I told him. I say you. Yeah. Hey, you know about more about this area than I do, but I, I've got a, a great guy that's an expert in this area, and I want you to read his material. Maybe, maybe we can talk about it. Well, what have I done? I've told him. I said, you know more than I do about this, but yeah. let's get together and talk about because he's got some. He is an expert in the area, in those areas, and he does have some very excellent evidences that I think you need to consider. And then can we sit back together and talk again? Would you meet me back here, and I'll bring you the book next week or whatever? Yeah. All right? Yeah. Okay. Videos two and three. And I've got another set of about four videos after the Geisler videos. Did you bring that? Yeah. I get them. Oh, you're I'll get them yeah. to you after okay. we get a little deeper into Geisler. And then we're going to get into homiletics. That'll be your last Veritas course if you've had all the courses uh, and passed all of the exams. <coughs> Some of you didn't take the exam. And passed all of the exams, then there will be a graduation ceremony, and we're going to do it upright. So I want you to I want you to appreciate what you what you've done and where, where you are. Hermeneutics, right? Homiletics. Homiletics. Putting together a. So. My podiatrist. <laughs> he said, "I told him about Chris." Yeah. Study to be a preacher, uh, and that's what he said. So he's studying that. Yeah. Well, good for him. Yeah. I had actually had a good conversation with my, my uh, general practitioner about a year ago. He was burning a thing off on my back, and uh, he, he, he used a word. He said, of course, you probably don't know what that means, and I told him what it meant. And, and that opened the door for theological conversation, and he wasn't a Christian. But he knew about some tribal people that... that that word related to, and we just had this great conversation. Every time I go in there, he, he goes, "You're that word guy, aren't you?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know my name, but he knows I'm that word guy. <laughs>